that's a distribution function. And uh, it actually wasn't in Cook and Torrance's paper either. And I figured it out by getting a copy of Cook's thesis uh, when that paper was published. And then I wrote an introduction to that paper in a compilation of important papers. And here it is. So you can see here, maybe I give one more for this row. You, you can see written out uh, basically the content of my last lecture, or at least the part of that that wasn't in the book. OK, so are we ready here? So I just handed out some pages in Davis, and I'll give them to the people who are doing the TV, and uh, they'll get them to you in Livermore. And I made an announcement on this board. Uh, you're going to mail me your homework, and the homework has to have at least an image, and I suggest that you'd have also the source files you should ch you've changed. Uh, I probably won't look at them if the image looks fine. And so this message says, put 275 in the subject line of your email. That way, when I get ready to grade them, they've come at disparate times. I can get them all together, not miss any and do that in the future, too. So today I'm going to go back to some ideas we were talking about two classes be before with the rendering equation. So um, let's see. I'll put it on this board. Basically, we're going to think of the light that's leaving a surface in a given direction as a sum of two components. The light that's emitted, if the light is, if, if it's a light source, like a bulb or the sun or, uh, you know, a hot stove or something, uh, leaving the surface, plus the light that's reflected. I should see, I should start using the eraser instead of my back of my hand for correcting things, x in direction theta. And what we know is, let me copy the light emitted again. And now let me put in that integral over all the light that's coming in from all directions and reflect it. Right? That's how we included the bidirectional reflection function. So that is the integral over the hemisphere above point x. So here, here, is point x. here is a piece of a surface with a point x. And uh, this light is reflecting in some direction theta, but it's scattering all light that comes in in all other directions f from direction capital Psi. And we integrate it over the unit hemisphere above the point x on this surface, all possible directions that are coming, light hitting the front third of the sur surface. And that integral we had was the bidirectional reflection function at x for light coming to direction theta from direction psi. And it didn't matter what order we put them in because of velocity. OK, times that light uh, coming in, which means hitting x from direction psi. And then we had a cosine of an angle between that direction psi and the uh, normal. Uh, let me make the, where am I going to make the normal? Maybe here. To the surface. So it's this angle, which the book writes as cosine of n at x and the direction psi. And then d, solid angle for the incoming direction. Right, so we'll integrate the, because, uh, you know, radiance is light per solid angle. Uh, per unit surface area normal to the beam. So this cosine theta factor uh, converts it into an irradiance on the surface. 
which may be slanted with respect to the incoming beam. There's some angle between them. And then this is the integral over all this hemisphere. So this is what we had, I guess it was last Friday. Okay, so if you look at this equation, this says, maybe I'll write it here, light again, x going out in direction theta, depends on light at a bunch of other surfaces, really, right? Because this is light coming from other surfaces at other points. Right? This, is this is outgoing light, this is incoming light, but we can actually get it in terms of outgoing light by finding out where the ray from x indirects in psi intersects another surface. If it, if it doesn't, it goes out into outer space, there's no incoming light. But usually, if we have an enclosed model, you know, every direction will intersect something, like the wall of this room. And so here's the point Y. And here is the light leaving Y in direction minus Psi, right? It's the opposite direction. So this integral here, we can write also as the integral over omega X with this FR. But we have to find the point Y, and we can say Y, we can take this ray with origin X, so R X Psi is the ray that starts out at X with, as its ray origin, and with this as its unit vector. And we can say, Actually, this notation means more than that, that this notation actually means the point Y, the first point, if any, that that ray intersects another surface. And so, for this L, going to X from direction Psi, we can say L at the point R X Psi, hard for me to draw capital Psi. Right, this is the point Y here. And leaving in direction minus Psi. Cosine D omega Psi. Now we have leaving light. So this is using the principle that was proved in the book that I didn't have time to talk about in class of uh, the equivalence of radiance, no matter where along a straight line ray you measure it, as long as there's no absorption or objects blocking. And they calculate it out in terms of the flux starting from one surface element and hitting another surface element. And that flux is constant, there's nothing in between. And then by the definition of radiance and a little bit of algebra, if you follow the derivation in the book, it says that the radiance is the same, whether it's measured at this point or that point. And that's what I've used when I've done this substitution. Okay, so now we have an equation where if you, you say, suppose you know the radiance leaving all the surfaces. Then this is a consistency equation that says something about the radiance leaving every point in your environment and going in every direction. So that's going to be your unknown that you want to solve for if you're trying to do global illumination. And this left-hand side has that unknown at a specific point and a specific direction, but it's, it's, it's expressed in this known quantity plus an integral over radiance at other points in other directions. So this is called a Fredholm integral equation of the second kind. And our goal in doing a global illumination is try to find approximations to the solution of it. We could never find the exact solution because we never, could never even represent it on a computer. Because a computer can store only a finite number of numbers. And this is a function of two continuous variables positioned all over the surfaces of the scene and directions every direction over a hemisphere from each of these points. 
So at most, you could sample it at a bunch of points or approximate it as you know, a piecewise linear or a piecewise polynomial or a piecewise constant function. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this uh, light reflected integral that I had on that board. Maybe I should copy it now. This Basically, this light reflected is the thing we're talking about now because we know the light emitted. X goes to theta. And that's what I expressed as this integral from the other board. I want to get it on this board. The light... Uh, at x, uh, theta coming from psi and reflecting into theta. And now the light at the position where this ray from x in direction psi intersects another surface times cosine of normal at x and this ray direction psi. I, I missed a, a minus psi here, didn't I? So what I want to do is rewrite this as an integral over surfaces. In other words, instead of saying what is starting from direction psi, figure out what surface is intersected. I want to start with some dA, y, around y, and do integrals over the surfaces in the scene. Well, if I'm going to do that, I have to know whether this point y is visible to x. In some cases, it may not be. There may be something in between. So the visibility between x and y is 1 if y is visible to x. That means if a ray between x and y doesn't intersect any other intervening object along the way, and zero otherwise. If that ray, that's like a shadow ray, sort of it's a test ray, if it does intersect something before it gets to y in the direction from y to x, I mean from x to y, then it's zero. So what I want to do is rewrite this integral as an integral over all the area of all the surfaces in the scene. So this capital A stands for all the surfaces in the scene. So it's really going to be a bunch of separate integrals, say an integral over that wall and an integral over that wall and an integral over my face or however you can parameterize the integral. But you think of it as an integral over dA here, dAy. And that means we have to turn this dAy into one of these solid angles at x. Right? Because this, this current integral is d omega. In order to convert this integral, we have to see how we express d omega in terms of dA. And so we had that formula, d omega for psi is this d a y we want the the area on a unit sphere so we have to divide it by the square of the distance between x and y which I'm denoting by r x y because uh, it's supposed to be area on a unit sphere which is solid angle and this area if you think about this distance here from here to here is R, X, Y. If this were actually, if the normal of this D, A, Y pointed along the direction Psi, that would be the right answer. But if it doesn't, right, and there's some angle between them, then we have a foreshortening. So times the cosine 
of the angle between the normal at y and the direction minus, let's see, why don't we think, think of it, let's, let's take the direction from y to x. So the notation in the book, I guess, for that angle minus psi in question is the vector from y to x. Think of it as a unit vector in that direction. Right? That's the uh, angle we're concerned with. And so that's the, the omega. And so now we can have this same fr at x going out in theta and coming in from the direction from x to y. Right? That's the direction of that psi. And now, instead of saying, this is the y that that ray first hits, we're going to say we're going to integrate over all y's on all surfaces, but we'll set to zero the ones that don't get to x by multiplying by the visibility between x and y. Okay, and then we have a factor that depends on these cosines. This is cosine nx. Uh, and this is the vector x, y. And then if I copy this, inter this terms here, cosine n, y, and the direction y, x, and then dA at y divided by r, x, y squared. Right? This, this much of it corresponds to d omega, and I put this one on there too. And so this quantity, this much of it, is called the geometry factor, g, x, y. If you read research papers, some other authors put the v, x, y in there too as part of the geometry factor. But our book doesn't. So, so basically, this, this uh, integral then, if I grouped all that as a geometry factor, I would just get for uh, my LR, I'd get the integral over all surfaces of this bidirectional affection function times L, Y, V, X, Y, G, capital G, X, Y, D, A, Y. So what we've done is we've changed an integral over solid angles at the point x to an integral over all surfaces in the scene of radiance leaving the surface. So that's another formulation of this reflected light. And if you rotate, uh, this is, yeah, it's, it's really, I said ly, but it's really L, let me, let me squeeze it in properly, it's L at the point Y leaving in the direction from Y to X. Right, that's what I really meant here. I, I think I, did I have it? Yeah, this is the direction from Y to X, and this is the point Y. So, now, the light at this point Y might be, if this light was a light source, that would be emitted light. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break up the light at Y also in these two terms. That's just because I want to have a separate expression for the direct illumination. In other words, what is the contribution to light emitted from this surface, if it were a light source? And that is what's going to give you the direct illumination, and it's going to include the shadow penumbra effects, but not the global bounces, which is the bounce light that actually got to Y from yet another surface. And so for the direct illumination, from... Uh, X reflected in direction theta. That's sort of what you'd be rendering if you were rendering like shadow effects from light sources. 
we could do that integral over the light sources. So we're going to integrate only over L of lights. And what we're going to integrate is this FR. I won't put all the angles in, but it's only going to be the emitted light at Y in the direction from Y to X. G of XY, uh, V of XY. I got them in the wrong order. DA at Y, where now we're integrating over, only over the light sources and we're integrating over the emitted light. So what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks is figuring out how to estimate that kind of integral. So if you were getting it at a very specific point, you might be able to do it geometrically. And in fact, historically, that was one of the first ways it was done in computer graphics. And if every point you were shading by direct illumination, you would actually make polygons of all the light sources and then clip the light source polygon by the projection of every other polygon in the scene onto that light source plane. So you remove the parts that were hidden and you would get another polygon that was left and then if the BRDF was like a Lambert law or something simple, you could actually get this integral analytically. But the philosophy now is to get it by sampling. You represent a bunch of points on the light source. And one method is just saying, okay, let's just make you know, this ceiling lamp be like 20 points in a row. Uh, and this area diffuser, which I can see that looks more like a polygon instead of a single tube, be, you know, maybe 10 by 10, 100 points. And you just illuminate it by all those point light sources. But that's not actually going to give you the correct shadow penumbra, especially if your points are like in rows across the light. Right? Because if I think about the shadow, we've got so much light in this room, I can't see the shadow from a single light source. But uh, if I have a bunch of, of rows of lights here, and I have points on the ground, and I have my piece of paper in between, there's some points on the ground which will see this many lights. You know, these points, these points, these points will see that many. And then once I cross the threshold so that this point is visible, it's going to suddenly get brighter. And I'm going to get stripes of light. In fact, if you use too many, too few light sources, you can really perceive it as just an image with a bunch of point light sources. And one solution to that is, for every pixel, take a different collection of dots on the light source. So you could imagine sampling the light source in some sort of random way with different samples for every pixel. And then it still wouldn't be exactly accurate because you're still estimating this analytic integral by sampling. But what you would do is you turn this banding error into what would look like noise, right? There's still, say if you only have 20 spots on the light source, there are only 20 different levels. But instead of being in a bunch of bands, there's a band sort of get broken up by the noise, by the random placement of those dots. So that's going to be the philosophy of our Monte Carlo sampling that we're going to start. I'll have some time today to even start on it. Um, and then you could do L indirect x coming out in direction theta, you might want to do that over the hemisphere of this fr l. And now this is the uh, reflected light instead of the emitted light. Uh, and I guess, what was it? It was at the point r x psi minus psi cosine uh, nx psi d omega psi. So to sample that, if here is your point x you're shading on this surface, we take a hemisphere and shoot rays out in that hemisphere. They're like shadow rays. Just like to estimate this thing, we 
see if the point on the light is visible. Now we just shoot a ray out here and see it's not a shadow ray, it's just a ray to see where it hits. And that's that point Y, which I have here is where that ray hits. And, you know, one way of, you know, this, you have to do this, it's still an integral equation. You still have to figure out this recursively, which is sort of one way to do that is to keep bouncing more and more until you eventually hit a light source. Uh, and then do the shading. Or you could say, okay, let's use Lambert law or some diffuse shading on the second bounces. So we'll assume the surfaces have diffuse shading, but they can sort of, you know, so at this point you might just do the kind of illumination you do with the sum of the light sources. But if I had a red wall on this side wall, and it was illuminating by the light source, and I was generating this wall, and I was tracing rays from here, and a bunch of them hit this wall, they would pick up some red color. And I would, even though this one I just shaded directly from the light source, I would get the rays that bounce here would pick up some red here from indirect illumination as well as the direct. And that's sort of a color bleeding effect that you get by global illumination. And we could do that by sampling this integral by the directions and then using some other way to get these. Or we could bounce, once we hit that wall, we could bounce again. And that's the path tracing that I also want you to do for the, the assignment after next. Not the next assignment, but the one after. You'll be sampling lights and you'll be sampling the global illumination environment. But what I want to start talking about today and next time is the mathematics between, I mean, and the mathematics about how to compute an integral by sampling. And it's based on probability theory. So I'm going to start just with an introduction to probability theory. So an event, so first off we're going to talk about discrete probabilities. when we have ability, when we only have a finite number of events, like a coin, you toss it, it could either come out heads or tails. Or if you roll a die, a single die, it has six faces to the cube. There are only six possibilities. So an event is one of those possibilities. So an event is the outcome of an experiment like flipping the coin or rolling the die and a random variable assigns a number to each event. So if you put numbers on the faces of the die and say, if that face comes up, I'm going to say my random variable takes that number, then instead of just events, I've actually got numbers out. And those are called random variables. So now the probability, if, if, it's, if it's a random event, then every event has a probability. So every event, say, I, has a probability P of I. And the random variable, say, X, uh, has and the random, what I want to say, and x gets the value x of i corresponding to event i. Right? We, right now we have only a finite number of different events. Okay, so the properties of the probability is that the probability is some non-negative number between 0 and 1. Right? So the probability that the coin will be... An event is, is, is a way to describe the outcome. So we could say uh, the probability of the event 
Um, the die coming up with number two is a sixth, if it's a fair die. But we could also make the event, in terms of looking at the outcome, say whether it's odd or even. Right? And so that would include two, four, and six, and the probability would be a half. So events don't have to be, you know, just, how can I say it? You think of an ex it depends on how you look at the experiment, basically. But, you know, the event could also be that uh, it's either one, two, three, four, five, or six. Then it's the probability would be one, that one of them would happen. Or the event would be the probability that the die ends on its point, which is never going to happen. So that probability is zero. So the other thing is if you sum over all the events, pi, that has to add up to one. Right? Because if, if you add them all together, it includes all the things that could happen, and one of them has to happen, so their probabilities have to add up to one. Because probability really means the chances, the fraction of the events that you'd expect that one to, have to be. So these are two, prop two uh, properties of probability. Uh, for anybody who came late, on this board I had the notice, please put 275 in the subject line of the email with your homework so I can find them all when it's time to grade them. Okay, so now, the expected value of a random variable x is written as e of x, and that's the average that you'd expect that random variable to have if you, you know, rolled the die a lot of times, we could ask, what is the average of the score we're going to get? And so what that is, is the sum over i of the score on the ith event times the probability of that event happening. So for a die, pi equals one six for i equals one two three four five or six those are my are my my six possible values of the uh, random variable six possible outcomes if I look at just what number comes up and so it's going to be one six times each of them of one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six. There's a formula for adding the first six consecutive numbers. For this many, it's just easier to add them. One and two is three, and three is six, and four is ten, and five is fifteen, and six is twenty-one. So we have twenty-one sixths, which is, I guess, I can cancel a three out of this and a seven. Seven thirds which is 3 goes into 7 twice. No. 7 halves. I canceled wrong. 7 halves. Right. Because I canceled 3 from each of these. So 2 goes into 7 3 times and a half left over. 3.5. Right. Which is sort of halfway in between. Okay. So that's the expected value of a die. And similarly, we can have the expected value of some function of a random variable. And that's the sum over i of this f of x i times the probability of i. Right, so we could say, uh, you know, the i face, suppose you painted, you had six faces, but you, instead of numbering them from one to six, you numbered them five, seven, twelve, 13, 27, and 91, right? Then that would be your f of the face number would be that other number. And then you could similarly add up the scores times the probability. So you can think of the events as separate from their scores. Okay, so let's see.
So the variance of a random variable That says how far away you would expect a given instance of the experiment, that, that xi, to be away from the average of the experiment. Sometimes this expected value is called the mean, right? The mean score that you get on the die is 3.5. Now, if you think about it, right, this number is bigger than 3.5 and this number is less. So they sort of cancel each other in terms of if you just look at the difference and then this difference would cancel that one, this difference would cancel that one, the expected value of the difference is zero because you have positive differences and negative differences. But if you look at the square of the difference, then the, both of them will be positive. And like people talk about the root mean square error of a measurement or something, that's sort of said, how the measurements vary on the average in terms of the squaring them first and then taking the square root. So that's called a standard deviation. And if we square it, that's the answer before you took that square root. That's going to be the, ex the variance. Sometimes I see variance of x instead of capital V instead of capital E. And what that is, then, is the sum of the value for all possible outcomes, the value of xi minus the expected value of x, this mean value, the 3.5 we had, squared. That multiplied by the probability of you know, that particular event. Um, so this is, you know, the squared quantity weighted by the probability. So this is what it really is. It's the expectation of x minus e of x squared. So I'm going to put extra brackets here. This, this now is a function of x. And... I'm taking the expectation of that function. And that's what it really amounts to, right? Because this is a constant as far as this experiment is concerned. We pre-compute the mean, and then each experiment is a deviation from that mean. So this x isn't a variable in here anymore, even though it looks like it is here. So now I want to get some properties of the mean and the variance. So the square root of the variance is what's called sigma, the standard deviation. So first I'm going to say if x and y are two random variables, We can even say our functions on the same event space. Right, so I, you know, in terms of a function, I was talking about printing those other numbers on the die. But you could think of printing two numbers on each die. Right? One of them is x and one of them is y. And then what we wa I want to show you is that the expectation of x plus y is the same as the expectation of x plus the expectation of y. And that's just algebra with the distributive law. Because E of x plus y, we can write as the sum over i of the xi plus yi we get from the ith outcome times the probability of the ith outcome. 
And by the distributive law, this is the sum over i of x i p i plus y i p i. And I'm putting parentheses just to make sure this sum is over both of them. But then we can write this as two sums plus the sum of all the second terms, y i p i. And that's the expectation of x plus the expectation of y. Okay, so if we do that, then I can get, an, if you b believe that proof, I could get another formula for the variance. Because what I'm going to say is the expectation of the quantity x minus e of x squared, well, this thing I can multiply out as x squared minus 2x e of x, where this one is a constant and this one is the variable, uh, plus 2e e of x, I'm not, not 2, plus e of x quantity squared. That's just re-expressing what I've got inside here. Okay, so now I can do, because of this rule, I can say it's the sum of these three things. So that means it's the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of 2x e of x plus the expectation of this constant e of x squared. Well, the expectation of any constant is equal to that constant, right? Because whatever that constant is, the expectation of it is the sum over i of that constant pi. And I can factor, I guess any time I factor out an expression from a sum, I'm actually using the distributive law. times the sum of the pi's, but because of that rule on the next board here that all the probabilities add up to one, this is just going to be the expected value squared, that constant, because this is going to be one. Now for this one, similarly, I'm going to factor out this constant 2ex, right? Because I'm going to write this as, well, why don't I think of it as, let me put the minus in front here. Is that going to make it any easier? No, it's not. Let me keep it the way it was. The expectation of this, as far as the uh, events in question, this is the x, and the 2e of x is the constant, the mean and the factor of 2. So I'm going to factor that 2e of x out, just like I did over here using the distributive law, and then it's the sum well, then it's the expected value of x, right? What's left is just x, and this is the expected value of x. So this term is minus twice the expected value of x squared. So I have minus two of them and plus one of them. So the answer is going to be e of x squared minus the expectation of value of x squared. So that's another formula for the variance of x. So instead of finding the mean and subtracting it, you can just, which would mean going through one loop to compute the mean and then another loop to, you know, compute these deviations, you can, in the same loop, compute the mean of x squared and the mean of x, and then just square this one and subtract it from that one. Okay, so... The last thing I want to discuss is the variance of the sum of two things. So if x and y are two random variables again,
is it true that the variance of x plus y equals the variance of x plus the variance of y? What do you think? Let's take a vote. How many people think it is? And how many people think it's not? Okay, so some people know that it's not. A simple example of it's not being is suppose I make my, the two numbers, x and y, put on each die face. I make x go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and y go 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Right? Then the sum of x and y is always 7. And its average is 7, and its variance is going to be 0. But the uh, variance of each of them, the book computes it by arithmetic, and I think the answer came out to be 2.9, certainly nine zero, right? Because, you know, none of those die are exactly 3.5 no, numbers. So this isn't true in general. So when is it true? All those people who raised your hand, uh, do you know, remember enough probability statistics to remember in what circumstances it is true? Now, the, the actual word is independent. And the two, word, two events are independent. So two, uh, I guess that's really random variables. X and Y are independent. If the probability, let me write it like this. I'm going to list the event inside by writing out x is equal to some value r and y is equal to another value s. If that probability, right, so we, we do the experiment. Remember I said event could be odd or even or anything. I can make as that what I'm classifying my outcome experiment into these events. And here's this particular event. I pick two numbers and I say, what's the probability that this random variable x will come out to be that number and the random variable y will come out to the other number? And that probability should be the same as the probability that x equals r multiplied by the probability that y equals s. Okay, so if I had two die and I, and I threw them and, you know, there weren't some sort of mysterious magnets connecting them or something where one affected, the first toss affected the second toss, they'd be independent, right? The probability that I get one on the first and three on the second would be a 36th, one of 36 equal chances. But even if they're not equal chances, you know, if one die is loaded and the other isn't, so one die has a higher probability of coming up six. If those dies aren't communicating, this fact will still be true. Whereas the fact that, you know, the previous case I gave, the role on the first number completely determines the role on the second number. They're definitely not independent. So if x and y are independent, then I claim the variance of x plus y equals the variance of x plus the variance of y. So how am I going to do that in two minutes? I'm not going to succeed. Uh, why don't you think about how you can use independence to prove this fact, and I'll prove it in class next time. Because otherwise, I'll run out of time today. And I already owe you a minute from yesterday, so now you've got that minute back.